Hello space fans and welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. This week, gravitational waves are detected and a small asteroid will pass close to Earth on March 5th. Heavy news, everyone! <laughs> Scientists using the Advanced Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO, in both Hanford, Washington and Livingston, Louisiana, have detected the very faint signal of two merging 30 solar mass black holes, 1.3 billion light years away. And the signal was in the form of gravitational waves. Now, I want to be clear here, since there seems to be some confusion regarding what was discovered, especially, and not surprisingly, among YouTube commenters. So let's be clear. Scientists have found ripples in space-time, not nipples in space-time, as many people on YouTube seem to think. Nipples in space-time is a different phenomenon entirely, and occur under a specific set of environmental conditions. Namely, a Super Bowl halftime show. <laughs> Zing! Oh man, it felt good to get that out. I've been holding on to that joke all week. <laughs> okay, back to our episode. <laughs> Predicted to exist by Einstein 100 years ago in his general theory of relativity, gravitational waves result when there is a sudden distortion in space-time from the interaction of very, very massive things, like from two merging black holes, or spinning neutron stars, or a neutron star collision, or from a supernova explosion, or heavy thing one merging into heavy thing two. You get the idea. And they were also created from the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, and their remnants permeate all the cosmos. Detecting gravitational waves is very difficult, but as I pointed out in SFN 144 when I told you about the launch of the LISA Pathfinder mission, scientists use extremely sensitive interferometers to carefully measure tiny distortions of space-time. And when I say tiny, I mean tiny. LIGO can measure the movement of space-time as small as one one-thousandth of a diameter of a proton. So imagine shooting laser beams at mirrors to look for a modulated displacements of less than a millionth of a billionth of a centimeter, smaller than the diameter of an atomic nucleus. That's the equivalent of measuring the width of a human hair at a distance to Proxima Centauri some four light-years away. Okay, I think I've made my point. This is a hard measurement. These waves were so small that when Einstein first talked about them, he never thought they'd be observed, that they would be too small to detect. But we live in the future now, and hard things are what we do. And this time, scientists have really hit the jackpot with this discovery, rivaling any others in the last century. So here's what happened. On September 14, 2015, after testing an upgraded and improved detector system, both stations in Washington and Louisiana recorded the merging of two approximately 30 solar mass black holes coming together some 1.3 billion light years distant. Each station recorded the signal 20 milliseconds apart, but they were identical. There was no question about it. They were looking at the same thing. And that's the main reason they have two observatories in two different locations in the first place, so they can check that they weren't just measuring the local conditions around the buildings and grounds and stuff like that. If both observatories measured a signal, then the local space-time conditions can be removed and be left only with the gravitational wave itself. Now, what's also very cool about what LIGO can do is that when they detect a signal like the one they announced yesterday, they can get lots of other information from it. The shape of the signal says a lot about what the event was, like a black hole merger or a supernova. The amplitude says a lot about the power of the event. And because they have two observatories, they can also tell what direction it came from. They can also see the black hole event horizon directly in gravitational waves. So the event detected back in September was of two merging black holes, as I've already said. And according to LIGO co-founder Kip Thorne of Caltech, the power output of the merger was 50 times greater than all of the stars shining in the visible universe combined. They also roughly estimated the direction of the event as somewhere in the direction of the Large Magellanic Cloud, and it happened some 1.3 billion light years away. Now, gravitational waves don't interact with matter. They are ripples in the fabric of space-time, so whatever is floating around in space may be jostled by them. They're so weak, though, that for all intents and purposes, they are invisible to us on scales of normal matter. So what does all this mean? Well, for one thing, it proves conclusively that black holes exist. For sure. 
I know that may sound weird, but black holes have been mathematical constructs for a long time, and their existence has been inferred by lots of other things we can see, like activity in the centers of galaxies. But now we know for sure they exist, because if they didn't, we wouldn't have observed this merging of the two of them into one bigger one directly. According to relativity, if two black holes merge, they would look exactly like this. And that's what was measured. It also means we can learn more about how the universe was formed. The remnants of the Big Bang are thought to be embedded in the fabric of space-time of the entire universe. And now we can begin looking for them. Oh, and by the way, gravitational waves have a sound. Here is what two merging black holes sound like. All right, now that this is out of the way, what kinds of things can we hope to see that we couldn't before? Well, spinning neutron stars, black holes eating neutron stars, neutron star collisions, merging black holes, galaxy collisions and mergers, supernovae, and of course, the above-mentioned early universe. We have never observed the universe in gravitational waves before, so we can't tell for sure what we will see, but plausible estimates predict between one half and several hundred events per year. Hopefully, the success of LIGO will invigorate interest in other ways of looking for gravitational waves, including at very different wavelengths. The discovery announced this week opens a new era and a completely new kind of astronomy. Gravitational wave astronomy promises to open our understanding of and provide an entirely new window into our universe. So thanks again, Einstein, and thank you, LIGO. Congratulations and well done. Next, a little closer to Earth, well, way closer to Earth, actually, a little, a little bit too close if you think about it, NASA has announced that on March 5th, a small asteroid could fly past Earth in between about 9 million miles or 11,000 miles from us. That's 14 million kilometers or 17,000 kilometers. This asteroid, known as 2013 TX-68, has flown past Earth before. Two years ago, it flew by at a rather comfortable distance of about 1.3 million miles or 2 million kilometers. This time around, it's going to get a lot closer, but NASA says it's not going to hit us. Scientists at NASA's Center for NEO Studies at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory say there is no possibility that this object could impact Earth during the flyby next month. But they have identified an extremely remote chance that the small asteroid could impact on September 28, 2017, but the odds are no more than 1 in 250 million. It's going to fly by again in 2046 and 2097, and those flybys have an even lower probability of hitting us. Asteroid 2013 TX-68 is estimated to be about 100 feet or 30 meters in diameter. Now, by comparison, that asteroid that broke up in the atmosphere over Chelyabinsk, Russia last about three years ago was a little bit smaller. It was approximately 65 feet or 20 meters wide. Now, if an asteroid the size of 2013 TX-68 were to enter Earth's atmosphere, it would likely produce an airburst with about twice the energy of the Chelyabinsk event. Now, astronomers say this asteroid's orbit is quite uncertain, and it will be hard to predict exactly where to look for it, but there is a chance that the asteroid will be picked up by, that, by our asteroid search telescopes when it safely flies past us next month. This will provide us with data to more precisely define its orbit around the sun. Now, while this thing won't hit us in March, or probably never, I bring this up because I, for one, am very happy this program exists, and I wanted you guys to know about it too. The Center for NEO Studies is charged with letting us know what's out there that could hit us as soon as possible, cataloging all the tiny and not so tiny bits of rock floating around our solar system left over from when the planets were formed. Now, if you're interested, and why wouldn't you be, NASA keeps a list of the next five close approaches to Earth. It has links to the, to the website with a complete list of, of recent and upcoming close approaches, as well as other data on the orbits of known near-Earth objects. So scientists and members of the media and public can track information on what's out there. Well, that's it for this week, Space Fans. Thanks to all Patreon supporters for helping make SFN better. We are almost at our first milestone, and I'm working on getting a free Deep Astronomy app ready for you to download. And thank you all for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Mm -hmm.